February 17, 1977, the richest woman in Chicago, Illinois goes missing and is nowhere to be found. And it isn't until 12 years later that a prosecutor takes the case on with the phrase, follow the fraud, solve the case. This prosecutor finds and uncovers so much shady activities going on in the city of Chicago. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the disappearance of Helen Brock. Helen Brock was born on November 10th, 1911 in Unionport, Ohio. She married her high school sweetheart in 1928 at just 17 years old, which she later divorced four years later. It was noted that she was very beautiful, but her beauty got her notice, but it didn't take her places, if that makes sense. She would work odd jobs for 17 years until 1950 when she decided to make the jump and move to Florida. And boy, did she get lucky. While working at a country club, she met none other than Frank Brock. As in the son of EJ Brock, the owner of the largest candy company in America. Frank was already in the process of divorcing his second wife, so Helen was very quickly introduced into the high life. Frank quickly introduced Helen into the horse racing world where he showed her his horses and they would regularly travel between Florida and Illinois to attend the races. They owned two estates, one in Illinois to be close to the factory and a penthouse in Florida as their getaway house. Frank would spoil Helen with jewelry, antiques, and her favorite was Cadillacs or, you know, just luxurious cars. In 1966, he sold Brock's candy and doubled his fortune. But at this time, he was already 76 and wheelchair bound. So things really slowed down. Four years later, she became a widow and she inherited $30 million. Since Helen wasn't as social as Frank was, she quickly began to isolate herself and that is where she started adopting a lot of fur babies. Which it is really funny and cute to know that she loved her animal charities, but she also loved wearing her fur coat baby. It was never missing. The only other man in Helen's life at the moment was her butler, who she called her houseman, John Matlick. And we're about to talk about him because three years after Frank passes, Helen meets Richard Bailey, who introduced himself as a rich horse dealer. Helen and Bailey met through a mutual friend and all Richard could think about was hang money, money, because he realized that Helen Brock was the Helen Brock, the heiress of the Brock Candy Company. Bailey was 20 years younger than Helen was, but she was okay with it because baby, who wouldn't be? She would say that the age didn't matter because she felt the connection because they both grew up very poor. Bailey was also born and raised poor in a Illinois farm and his highest level of education was the ninth grade. So Richard Bailey was a driving instructor as well as a dancing instructor, but his specialty was sweeping women off of their feet because baby, he was a gigolo. Bailey had moved to Chicago to start dealing horses. And by the time he had met Helen, he had already started that company you want to call it that so this was the richard bailey special he would meet a lonely or widowed woman he would wine and dine them you know sweep them off their feet once he got their trust he would sell them a horse but here's the catch most of those horses were always either injured worthless or disabled and not only that, he would buy them at a fraction of the cost that he would actually sell them for. Now, let's go ahead and go back into the timeline. Helen was never stingy with Bailey. If anything, she was overabundant with him and she always took him on vacations and she would just let him splurge out. One of those many vacations was when she told Bailey that she was ready for a horse. And that year, she ended up buying three horses from Bailey, which cost Bailey $18,000, and he sold them for $95,000. Now, 
the relationship just continued to roll out and she was falling in love with him she was curing her sadness she was falling in love with the d i mean she was falling in love with bailey <laughs> helen later on had a scheduled routine checkup where she was interned for five days and after being released she got her stuff and she stopped at a gift shop it's noted that she told the cashier to hurry because her houseman was waiting for her outside after she completed her purchase she pulled on her fur coat she walked outside got in the car and was never seen again john matlick the guy that we had talked about before said that he dropped off Helen at O'Hare International Airport where she was supposed to fly back to Chicago. The flight crew was asked if Helen did board and keep in mind there was no such thing as TSA back then so it was just off of the memory of the people that flew the plane or the flight attendants but nobody was able to say that Helen was on that flight. Matlick then says that he picked her up back from the O'Hare airport and took her back to her house in Illinois and he called his wife and said that he wouldn't be able to go home because of work which was very suspicious and then Matlick told the police later on that Helen stayed because she was preparing for a trip that she had coming up in Florida with Bailey but when people would stop by the house, Matlick would tell them that she was really sick or that she was unavailable. Why are you being weird, Matlick? Matlick sticks to his story and he says that he takes her to the airport where she's gonna go off to Florida on a flight at 7 a.m. But Miss Helen was not an early riser and none of her luggage was taken to the airport. It was all still there in her house. There's also no record of Helen on that flight. During this time, Matlick said that Helen had written him $15,000 worth of money in checks. But when the police investigated and found out that it was not Helen indeed, he changed his story saying that he was signing for her because she had injured her hand. Another red flag is that Matlick didn't report Helen missing until two weeks after he hadn't seen her. Why would you not report it immediately if this is the lady who gives you your money? Helen's brother was also really weird in this process because when Matlick informed him, he wasn't in very much of a rush. And when he did come to make the police report, they started going through Helen's stuff and they started burning her diaries because there was supposedly a note that said that if she died, she wanted her stuff to be burnt, but they didn't even keep the note that said burn everything. John Matlick also failed, I think, four lie detector tests, but since they're inconclusive, that wasn't able to be held against him. The next suspect in line was Richard Bailey because he was her lover and he was expecting her in Florida and according to Matlick's account, she was dropped off at the airport. Bailey did hire an attorney so he wasn't able to talk to the police regarding any of the information. Helen was legally declared dead in 1984 and her money went to John Matlick, some animal foundations that she had, and her brother, her sketchy brother. It wasn't until 1989 that a prosecutor started looking into horse fraud, which was where he was able to make the connection and started looking into Helen's case. It was revealed that Richard Bailey had connections with Silas Jane, who was founder of the Jane Gang, which was an organized crime for horse mafia. Horse mafia, yes, you heard it right. Silas was involved in disappearing three other women in 1966, which is why the prosecutor decided to take on this case. So the theory is that Helen had caught on to Bailey scamming her and the horse abuse, and she was actually going to tell the authorities, but Bailey caught on to that and she, he wanted to nip it in the bud. So he conspired and had others kill her. So in 1994, Bailey was charged with numerous counts of fraud and also in conspiracy for murder. However, he only pleaded guilty to conspiracy, mail and wire money laundering, as well as scamming Helen Brock. He also admitted to conning older and widowed women. In 2005, Joe Plemons 
said that him and 10 others did organize the crime and he was the one who shot Helen, but he did sign something that would not persecute him with his confession. He said that he just couldn't live with the guilt. He did state that Bailey had nothing to do with her murder, but detectives didn't see this as a credible source. There was one piece of evidence from his testimony that detectives did actually consider valid, which was her ruby ring that Helen would wear. But other than that, the police just didn't find him as a credible source. Bailey tried to get a new sentencing hearing with the testimony that was provided by Plemons, but in 2005, the court ruled against him and he was in prison until 2019 where he was released at the age of 90. John Matlick passed away of old age at the age of 79 in a nursing home, but Helen Brock's body has not been found and there is no clue as to where she could be. So if you have any information, please do not hesitate to call the Chicago Police Department.